Welcome, welcome. Let's all stand and turn in our hymn books to page 238. I must tell Jesus. Sing it loud. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus, Jesus, all of my troubles, he is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my troubles quickly in end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me, oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. That's why we're here tonight, because we have a great Savior, amen, as that song says. And uh, tempted and tried, I need a great Savior. And so, hope you're having a great week. Hope that the Lord's been good to you. I know He has, and I uh, hope you recognize it, amen. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into a couple of prayer letters. All right, Brother Larry, open us up in prayer, please. Amen. You may be seated. And our first letter tonight from the McCormick family, our missionaries in Peru, their October update. It says, the hardest homonym. All right, a homonym is one, or, one of two or more words spelled and pronounced alike but different in meaning. At least that's what Webster says. He says, I was definitely grappling for the definition for a few minutes, and regrettably, I cannot say I was much better in high school. Spelling and grammar in general were not necessarily ever my strong suit. However, I do believe the hardest homonym I've ever come across is a homonym here in Peru. That homonym is Jesus and Jesus. No, you did not misread that, but allow me to explain. Most Peruvians believe in Jesus. They've heard of Jesus for their entire lives. They even worship Jesus. There's a great difference, though. They worship a baby Jesus because he's the son of Mary. They worship a dead, crucified Jesus. But the resurrection, let alone its significance, is rarely, if ever, mentioned. We are saying the same name, but the meaning of that name is oh so different. Because of this hard homonym, a common story here in Peru is for people to go from, quote, saved to unsaved to saved. Last month, we requested prayer for a young man named Gerardo, his mother Jacqueline, and his grandmother Vicky. We met Gerardo during the English classes we offered at our Saturday English, uh, I'm sorry, I, 
think I misread that. Okay, we offered at our church. I jumped a line there. And I slowly began to build a friendship with him. Week after week, Gerardo sh showed up to the Saturday English classes and then to the church services the following day. When asked, Gerardo was, would say he was saved, that he, in fact, quote, had always been saved. Then we began discipleship. As we uh, started studying the Bible together weekly, the differences in the homonym, the differences of the Jesus he had heard of, of versus the Jesus of the Bible became starker and starker. At last, one day during our Bible study, he told me, I need this. I need to accept Christ as my Savior. You know, uh, sorry, you know those moments in life where you just feel like jumping up and down and shouting, shouting with joy, but you know you probably shouldn't. The day Gerardo accepted Christ as, a person, as, pers as his personal Savior was definitely one of those moments for me. Thank you, church family, for praying for this young man. Please continue to pray for us, with us, for Gerardo's family to accept Christ as well. As a result of several of the outreach events we've had at our church, we've been able to start several new Bible studies during the week. And as these people have heard the truth and have understood the difference between the hardest homonym, they have invited us to share the truth with their family and friends. All of this together has led a rather good problem, led to a rather good problem to have, I suppose. Our church is located in one of the poorest di districts in the city, meaning many people do not have running water, electricity, or public transportation. Consequently, as our Bible study network continues to expand, our church is becoming farther and farther from the people that we are reaching. Yet because only members of the church, yet because this area is so unreached, we are still the closest church to these new believers. Since we are currently the only members of the church with a car, we are using our five-passenger vehicle to make multiple pickups and drop-offs for every service and event. I know what that feels like. If you've ever been a youth pastor, so do you. All right. Uh, please pray with us for wisdom in making decisions for our church's newfound transportation needs so we can effectively get people to and from church each week to learn who the real Jesus is. Amen. Your missionaries to Peru, Mitch, Jacqueline, Landon, and Ryan McCormick. All right. And so praises. They're praising God that Gerardo made a profession of faith. They're praising God for the over 15 visitors they've had this past month at the church and that they've been able to start a Bible study with many of them. And then prayer requests, please pray be praying for our upcoming outreach event on October 30th. Please also be praying for our church's transportation needs as we seek to help more people be able to come to church. Amen. So keep praying for the McCormicks and uh, thank God for uh, what he's done in there. And then the Damascus is over in Scotland, Rick and Sarah. I think today was her birthday, in fact, um, or yesterday. I can't remember. All right, but uh, it says, Dear Servants of Christ, autumn is upon us, and for me it brings about a spirit of reflection and thanksgiving. Uh, we truly are blessed by God over, we are blessed by God over his blessings this past month. September was missions month at the church. We had special speakers each week and added a missionary family for a total of six to our missions family. The, uh, so a total of six missionary families they support now. The church has been faithful in giving towards their faith promise commitments each year. We've had a couple people from the states visit and encourage us in our ministry here. One young lady came at a good time and helped us in our youth activity that month in the escape room. Though no one successfully escaped in the time given, we enjoyed it and the gospel was presented. Uh, anniversary Sunday was on the 9th of October and it was amazing. We passed out a thousand flyers in Kingcorth and invited families who we've been reaching for the last few years. We encouraged our church families to invite neighbors and friends also. We wanted to double our attendance, which we usually have around 45 each Sunday, and we hit 89 in attendance that day, just one shy of double. Amen. That's pretty good, though. Many heard the gospel for the first time. I just say 89 in any church plant, independent Baptist church plant in Scotland is remarkable, just in the U.K. at all. Uh, I know missionaries, again, that have been there 30, 40 years and are running 15 people, and battling. I'm not saying they're doing a poor job. It's just remarkable how God has blessed the Damascus. Just want to say. Anyway, God's been good to them. Many heard the gospel, he says, for the first time that day. We pray that visits to these homes will provide us an opportunity for those lost to be saved. We have officially filled the space on our first bus, which is a 17 passenger, and we're, we're in need of another. God answered that prayer by working on the heart of a church in the States to give we officially purchased our second bus and are working on getting it set up and ready to go. Please pray for us as we seek another faithful driver to go out each week and pick up families. Um, 
Let's see what blows away there. The fundraisers are off to a great start with contributions from our church family in selling and donating items and monthly commitments. We have community fundraisers set up for the 29th of October, which is Harvest Day over there, and the 19th of November, which is a Christmas fair. Uh, with volunteers from the church hosting them, we pray that these special days bring in much funds and encouraged, encouragement to our church family. 25000 down and 75000 to go. Many have left the Church of Scotland and have had to merge and have building closures we hope our outreach and community events will show people our interest and ability by god's grace to keep a gospel light in aberdeen though difficult to fit all that god has done this past past month in one letter we hope you receive a blessing thank you again for your faithful prayer and support for us in god's ministry here in scotland in christ the damascus family your missionaries of scotland and uh, lord willing hopefully in april or i should say may may end of may beginning of june when we Go on a missions trip there. Uh, we're going to be stopping up to see Rick and Sarah. I look forward to getting to see that with my own eyes at their church. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing some more, brother. All right, let's all stand, turn in our hymn books to 685. I've got a mansion. Appreciate that so much, and you can take out uh, uh, well, take out something to write on if you're taking down the prayer request tonight. And we want to lift up our uh, missionaries, the McCormicks. All right, pray that they can get a new or a van, something to carry more than five people. Um, I think my record was 29 in our 15 pasture van in Texas. Um, that's not public information. I guess it is now, though. So. 
They were very small people. It was for VBS. <laughs> was, they were children. And <laughs> so, anyway, that was back in my wild and crazy youth pastor days. I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. All right. Um, but the McCormicks and then the uh, Damastis family, uh, be with, uh, pray that they'll, they need a second van. Or no, they got the second van. I'm sorry. Um, but they need to raise another $75,000 to be able to purchase the building that they're looking at. And uh, um, so pray for them. Then I want you to do something before we go any further. Uh, how many were here on Sunday and got one of our um, get-to-know-your-guest missionary um, things? How many did not? Let me ask you that. Uh, if you were not here Sunday morning, you didn't get one. Miss Alyssa needs one. Cody, they're right there. Um, who did not get If you didn't get one, raise your hand up, okay? Let's make sure everybody has one. And I'm going to go through this real quick. I should have done this Sunday because it's a little different with a missions conference. Everybody's not going to be here the whole time. In fact, none of these people are going to be here all Sunday morning through Wednesday night. So I want you to write down on here if you, um, if you haven't already. All right, so here's Pastor Art Cole. He's our special speaker for Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night. All right, so Sunday, Monday, they'll be here. Because you, if you signed up to give them a gift card, first of all, I hope you're going to just plan on being here every service and then... You don't have to worry about it. Just have your gift cards, and you can make sure you get them, all right? You get them to them. So if you're a member of our church, you ought to be planning to be here every service, okay? Be faithful, all right? Then Matt Wilkerson, who I just found out last night, was talking to him. He's engaged. Or, I'm sorry. He's not engaged yet. I shouldn't even be saying this because we're on the live stream. But I doubt they're watching. But uh, I said I, he had, his Facebook profile had him with a, with a young lady. I said, engaged? He said, he said, not yet, but I was at the jeweler today. I was like, all right, man. So um, so Brother Matt Wilkerson will be here Sunday through Tuesday, okay? Will not be here Wednesday night. All right? And so you can write that down on there. And then the Hain lines on the back side there at the top, the Hain lines will be here just Monday and Tuesday. They're going to be, I remember, they're, they were kind of an emergency throw-in. I wanted to get them to come for next year's missions conference but um we had that missionary family double book and not be able to come to ours and then the shives are coming a couple weeks later so i said so we need another family so the hain lines are coming up from washington dc on monday going to be here monday and tuesday only okay and then the shives november 13th you still buy them a gift card wait november 13th when they're here we want to be a blessing to them it's kind of the missions conference addendum or extended however you want to say it a couple weeks later and uh so um so that's the shives, all right? And so um, they'll be here November 13th, all right? And be in prayer for our missions conference, all right? And the, the Lord will work in our hearts. Um, plan, of course, um, to be faithful. Put some feet to your prayers, all right? If you want to pray for the missions conference to go, well, you can start by showing up, amen? And uh, be a blessing to our guest speaker, uh, Brother Art Cole, be preaching again Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night. Brother Chad Hainline will preach Tuesday night. Brother Dan Smith from Syracuse, Buckley Road Baptist Church, and New York State Church Planting uh, will be here on Wednesday night, and uh, we want to be an encouragement to them. All right, and then um, something else I need to uh, just say, we need to pray for um, churches that are affected um, by Hurricane Ian still, all right? And um, one in particular, I Lord laid on my heart to... Uh, uh, it's a church that the Westgate Baptist Church in Tampa, the church that Hannah goes to, has been traveling down to every week with loads of, you know, cases of water and gasoline and and uh, charcoal even and just different uh, dry goods and non-perishable items taken down to people who are who are displaced. There's still hundreds of thousands of people that are not in their homes. I mean, their their homes. And one of those in particular is Tri Cities Baptist Church in Port Charlotte. Um, and uh and their pastor they have 10 children and they're living in a tent right now um and uh i cannot imagine because it's not, it's hot in florida all year i mean especially they're down southern part of florida anyway it's hannah said they had a cool front today it was like 75 <laughs> it was like you know 70 75 or something like that um i can't remember exactly what she said temperature wise but anyway they're they're staying in a tent um and they've done nothing to help themselves. They've just been trying to help others and, and being at their church to be there for people to come and get supplies and doing nothing for themselves. But this Sunday, our church is going to do something for them. Amen. And uh, we'll have pictures. We have uh, some photos of their house. Their whole first floor is underwater still. 
all right um they have a, they had a two story home um and the whole first floor is underwater they have pictures of them rowing a boat up to their house you know and all this stuff and um again they haven't asked for anything they haven't done anything they don't even have any clue that we're doing this this church this pastor and his family uh but we'll have their uh pictures up on sunday morning sunday morning we're going to present that as a need and encourage you to give toward that i realize you've already given uh toward uh, gift cards for our guests i understand that um and i'm asking you to do a little bit more for this family okay and i will too all right and um so um let's uh let's be ready to do that on sunday and i'll I'll uh, I'll uh, get with Brother Larry on how we're going to do that exactly too, because um, it gets tricky once you get up to a certain amount you give somebody it turns into a tax liability and all this stuff. So, um, stinking stinking uh, government, amen. Stinking IRS, yeah. Anyway, but uh, so pray about that if you would, and uh, I'll be putting a prayer line call out about it as well as a text onto a, our texting thread men uh, before the end of this week, and so. Um, be prepared for that but let's pray for those churches in florida that have been hard hit by the hurricane okay um and who has something to add tonight you can raise your hand right up and and we'll uh get a microphone to you so you can miss donna my neighbor betty her daughter her name is carrie is in the hospital in not very good condition she has um a ton of blockage in her brain and they're not even quite sure how to approach it okay. so if you could just remember Carrie okay thanks <coughs> we'll definitely do that but Larry I have to back up a little bit uh, for last week because uh, Jeannie is is fine mm -hmm. so far and I I didn't make mention of how thankful I am that you folks prayed uh, and so as it, as it progressed and we went through the tests and all that stuff and everything was fine, it just dawned on me. It's a, like you folks are praying and you pray. Amen. And so that's that's why I brought it up was because I wanted prayer for that. So, yes, sir. so that's praise the Lord for that. And I uh, continue praying for my son, Jeremy, also because it could be serious. But then once again, we'll pray for him and see what the Lord does. Definitely will pray for him. Yes, sir. That's what a church family is for. Amen. Zach, go ahead. Uh, please just keep, uh, keep praying for my mom, uh, Christine. She's uh, is her third chemo treatment. Um, just keep her in your prayers. We'll definitely do that, brother. Continue praying for Zach's mom for sure. Amen. Keep us posted on when's her next PET scan due, do you know? Here it in a few weeks they usually do so many and then have a scan to see how it's working you know but okay be praying for man somebody else up here at the front brother scott or brother bob take your pick you guys can arm wrestle for it um please continue to be in prayer for uh rowena um on monday we go for the cat scan um that will determine whether or not the chemotherapy was successful. Um, and then I believe it's uh, 10 days after that she'll get the results. But um, nonetheless, uh, we've been praying her to recovery. <coughs> Up to this point, please continue your prayers. Sure Thank will. You. Definitely praying. Yes, Brother Bob? Yeah, well, a uh, uh, praise. Um, Bill, I mentioned last week that he had to go in for an echocardiogram, and his heart's great, um, which which is amazed me. But um, he still has some kind of a lung thing going on that we haven't figured out yet. Okay, keep praying for Bill. Bill and Irma used to come every Sunday morning to church. They were here, and uh, so a couple of Bob's patients. Yeah, Justin. I just want to praise the Lord. I've been asking, trying to find a job that I can get weekends off with Jax. And, um, you know, sometimes we ask God for things and he tells us to wait. And, uh, or then he just flat out tells us no. But, uh, he, uh, he gave me a job. Um, I just praise the Lord. He's been saying yes a lot to me lately. So just praise the Lord that, uh, I found something and, um, 
the job that I'm going to like. And uh, just praise God for all that he does for us, even though we fail him. He's Amen. still interested in us for some reason. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. Somebody else? Anybody else? Check online there, Hayden, if you would. Anybody else have anything to add? Uh, I have something to add. All right. Um, so a praise, actually, for my mom. I know I've <coughs> um, talked to you, Pastor, about just uh, the Lord working in her heart. And um, the Lord's given me opportunities to have conversations with her. And uh, she's had more of a uh, questioning spirit, asking me questions over the last couple months. And um, the Lord just gave her a job where instead of working swing shifts, um, which she shouldn't be doing at her age, but um, s now she's working Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, and I told her already, I'm like, all right, well, this means I'm going to bug you like every other day to come to church. I hope you know that and you're ready for it. So um, I think the Lord's opening doors there. So pray that the um, that she'll continue having that spirit, continue asking questions, and hopefully uh, come to see Jesus as your Savior. She just might if you don't tell her she's too old to work. For her old, yeah. All right. Miss Carol. I just like prayer for Weston. Next week he's got to go for some test uh, to see if he's gluten, stout, whatever. <laughs> all the class with all his issues he's been having, just I ask prayer for him. He's going next Tuesday. Okay, definitely. All right, Hayden. Um, from Barb Cronk, please pray for unsafe family members. Praise God for a great day at work. Okay. Unsafe family members. Okay. All right. All right, anybody else have anything to add? All right, as I pray aloud, you feel free to bow your head right where you're at if you'd like to and join me in prayer silently as I pray aloud. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for all you've done. We approach your throne tonight thankful for your goodness to us and thankful that we can bring our petitions to you, uh, Lord, <clears throat> as a God that cares and that uh, loves on us time and time and time again. Um, I... I uh, as a father, Lord, I, I see the similarities and the, the crossover, uh, Lord, uh, uh, pictures of, of how we deal with our own children and how you deal with us, even though we deal with our own kids, Lord, in an imperfect way, because we are imperfect. Um, Lord, there's glimpses, Lord, of, of how you deal with us. And uh, no matter how many times we come to you, we can come to you one more time. We can still come to you one more time. And what a blessing that is. <clears throat> what a what a joy and privilege it is to come to you, Lord. I pray that you'd be with our missionaries tonight. We lift up the McCormicks to you tonight. And I pray that you'd continue to bless them down there. Thank you that their Bible studies and uh, the church plant, Lord, has uh, grown to the point where they need a van because they're making too many trips with their car to get everybody there. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you would just help them in that area and help them continue to be faithful. Lord, be with, uh, be with Brother Mitch and that he would just lead his family as he should. And, for his wife and children that they'd follow as they should and you continue to heal their hearts from uh, their stillborn baby from a few months ago lord and i know that's probably uh, something they don't mention anymore but i'm sure the burden is still there and the hurt and so i pray that you would heal them up from that and continue to be a balm uh, for that wound and i just pray for them i pray for the damascuses thank you lord what a what an amazing thing lord to have at 89 in church lord uh, just a few years into a church plan in scotland is is a remarkable thing, Lord, and you've done a great work there, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise. I know Brother Rick has worked hard, and you've blessed his efforts, and uh, Miss Sarah as well. And so I pray you continue to bless their little church. I pray you would help them as they, uh, Lord, raise the money to buy a building and, and be able to have a church building. And pray you just bless them there. Pray you be with our missions conference coming up, Lord. Help us to uh, pour our hearts into our uh, missionary families that will be with us and Continue to help uh, them as they travel in, Lord, to give them safety and uh, help Brother Art uh, Cole, Lord, to have the messages that we need <coughs> and uh, that you would just speak to our church family through those messages. Um, and uh, I'm just excited to, to see what you're going to do in my heart, Lord. And uh, Lord, I pray that I'd be open and receptive, Lord, to whatever you want uh, from me. So help me, Lord, there and help all of us to do more for missions this year than we've ever done before. And Lord, I pray that our church would be able to take on we've got uh, two new missionary families here at the time of the conference and then one more coming uh, later on a few uh, uh, weeks later 
And uh, we just pray that you would make provisions there, Lord, for those families to be taken on for support as they plant churches here in America and around the world. How exciting it is to be a part of Faith Promise missions and local church missions as you've guided and directed us, Lord. And I pray for these churches in Florida. I pray that we'd be able to be a blessing to this pastor's family uh, down uh, south of Tampa, Lord. And uh, Lord, as they're struggling, living in a tent, Lord, and uh, unable to even get into their home yet. And and uh, no doubt, Lord, the costs are probably piling up and insurance companies are slow. And uh, I pray that you would just help them, Lord. I pray that we'd be able to be a blessing to them on Sunday and that you do a great work in and through our church uh, to be a blessing to them. And I pray that you'd be with uh, <clears throat> these other requests, Lord, I think of uh, Carrie with the, the blockage in her brain, Lord, Miss Donna's neighbor's daughter, and pray that you would just be with her, pray you'd open their eyes to their need of Jesus if they don't know you, and that, Lord, you'd help them to get saved and turn to you in faith. I pray for uh, 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 all these others, Lord, I think of Jeremy May, and uh, just pray you'd help him and be with him, uh, work things out in his life, and, and most of all, get his attention, Lord, to help him turn to you. Uh, all lots of praises tonight, Lord, we pray that, praise you that Miss Jeannie's doing okay, and, and uh, Lord, the test came back normal. We praise you for Miss Rowena, and, and uh, Lord, I know she's got the scan on, on Monday, but Lord, I uh, uh, pray that uh, all the signs and where they point would truly uh, come to fruition, and that Lord, she'd have no cancer anymore, that it'd be eradicated from her body. Uh, we praise you for uh, uh, Bill's EKG uh, going okay and his heart being okay. We praise you for uh, Justin getting the job that uh, he doesn't have to work weekends. What an answer to prayer that is. Lord, to think of Cody and, uh, Lord, uh, his mom and how she's shown interest in the Lord. And, and uh, Lord, the, through Cody's witness, Lord, that you'd bring her to you. We just ask for that. And we thank you for the progress there. Uh, we think of uh, the others that uh, are just praising you tonight for all that you've done for them. We lift up Zach's mom with the chemo and Miss Christine. Pray that you just help her. And, uh, Lord, that uh, here in the next few days or weeks, Lord, whenever she has her PET scan, they'd show improvement. Pray that Zach would be able to be a testimony to her if she doesn't know you as Lord and uh, that you would just work in her life. I pray for, uh, uh, I pray for uh, Weston and his test next week that he's coming up on. pray that you would just uh, uh, strengthen him for that. I pray that they'd reveal what they need to reveal and that uh, they'd be able to help te- uh, Weston with his food intolerances, Lord, along with that diabetes diagnosis that he got. And I pray you just help him there. Pray for all of our unsaved loved ones. Miss Barb Cronk put that in, Lord. But all of us have unsaved friends and family members and loved ones that need to come to you and uh, pray for them. And pray that we'd be the kind of testimony we ought to be to our unsaved friends and family members and just continue to work in our church. We love you tonight. Thank you for all you've done. Bless your word now as we dump, jump into the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we continue on in our series here in 1 Peter. It's a book chock full of uh, practical instruction for us as Christians. And I hope that it's been a help to you so far. And uh, last week was our Christian conduct as a citizen. This This week, our Christian conduct as a servant. As a servant. We're here to serve. Amen. We're here to serve. Uh, one of the uh, pharisaical uh, men in the, in the New Testament that approached Jesus, he said, who is my master? In a mocking <coughs> sort of way. Uh, what, what are you guys in the sound booth? Grab me a cup of water, please. Thank you so much. Uh, but they said, who is my master? In a mocking way, mocking Christ and, and uh, making fun and, and, and really uh, a hypothetical question. He didn't want to know the real answer to that question. Uh, But uh, let's read in verse number 18. It says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, 
should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. And the key uh, part of this passage is there at the end of verse number 23. It says, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. We often say uh, things around here like God always balances the scales. We often say things like God hasn't lost track of where you're at. God hasn't lost track of you. God has not uh, uh, just fallen asleep and gone, well, I don't know what happened. So, oh, man, I didn't expect him to be over there. I didn't realize he was in that predicament or that situation. No, God doesn't lose track of anybody. He knows how many hairs are on your head, the Bible says. He knows when a sparrow falls from its nest. He, he takes care of the lilies of the field. And if he takes care of grass and birds, then how much does he care about you? He certainly does. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Philippians 2.3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. You can even look at this one. It's just across the page in my Bible. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil in his lips, that they speak no guile. We're told to be subject. To be subject, it says in verse 18. Servants, be subject. Now, there were different types of servants in this day and time in the Roman Empire. Some historians have said that over one-third of the Roman Empire was in some form a servant, uh, we would call them slaves. Okay? They were, by the way, slavery goes back farther than America, just so you know. We didn't invent it. Okay? All right? It is a scar on our nation, but we didn't come up with it. It was going on long, and it has been going on ever since mankind uh, fell from into sin in the garden of eden and thereafter it's been going on okay but over one third of the roman empire was it was you could call it culturally accepted in the roman empire and so paul's going listen you're in a culture where this is accepted behavior you need to act right as a servant if you are a servant to somebody you need to act right some of the slaves uh, were hired because of debt many of them were if you were uh, uh indebted you didn't just get to go to court and go hey bankruptcy Write it off. I don't know anybody anything. <laughs> All it cost me is bad credit for seven, ten years. No. You became a slave to somebody if you owed them money and would not pay them back. You had to take care of your debts. Some were bought with money as slaves. Some were taken captive in wars. Uh, some were born into it. If you were a slave as in, and your children were born, then, then you're, you were born into slavery. You were servants. Some serve by contract for a limited time. All right, so this is addressing all of these, not just people who are enslaved in the sense that they were against their will being held uh, and made to work hard uh, without uh, any compensation. Many slaves were compensated with with room and board and all these things they were taken care of. All right, Uh, some were not. It just depended on your master. But Peter has stuff to say about that later on, about how masters ought to treat their servants. And Paul certainly had lots to say about it. But there were some servants or slaves uh, in this time, and Peter's addressing the Jews here, uh, that thought that their Christian liberty set them free from their unbelieving and sometimes cruel masters. Well, I'm saved now. I'm, I'm free. I'm free. You're not even my boss anymore. Peter says, no, that's not how it works. In fact, he says you need to be subject, which means to submit or to put yourself under. Be subject. Be subject. Be subject to your masters with all fear. Well, how does that look on a practical level? Well, it looks like somebody who does their business faithfully and honestly. It looks like somebody who does their business faithfully and honestly. They serve. They're a good employee to their boss. Their boss can count on them being on time to work. Their boss can count on them giving an honest day's labor. Their boss can count on them going the extra mile and doing the best they can and, and uh, uh, fulfilling all the expectations that he lays out for them. 
It looks like someone, the second thing here is that somebody who conducts themselves with respect for those to whom they are to be subject to. They honor the position of the boss. That's something that's seriously, seriously lacking in our day and age, isn't it? I was just here, there today at Home Depot and overheard home, two Home Depot uh, employees working on the shelf behind me. They didn't know I was kind of eavesdropping on their conversation, but it was hard not to hear as they griped and griped and griped about their boss, and it sounded pretty petty. Well, I just heard him say we were going to do that. And not that blah, blah, blah. All these entitled things that they thought they were entitled to. It says, servants, be subject to your own masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also the forward. I guess that means that, well, you don't know my boss. It doesn't fly as an excuse with the Lord. Well, and it didn't used to fly as an excuse in our country, but now everybody gripes about everything. I've told you the story about our the sign company I worked for in Fort Collins, Colorado, before we moved out here to New York, and we had a good boss. I mean, he really was. He wasn't was a bad boss. He was lenient. People would show up late to work. He wouldn't even reprimand them. I mean, he was very lenient, very, like, easy going. But you know what? No matter how good you are, if people are tendency, have a tendency to a critical spirit and a griping attitude, they're going to gripe. You could give out a $1,000 bonus every week, and they'd still probably find something to complain about, wouldn't they? As Christians, we ought not be that way. As Christians, we are called on by God to not be that way. He says, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. He says, for what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. Well, he's saying, okay, you do something wrong, okay? You, you, uh, uh, you, you steal something from your employer and he fires you for it. He says, there's no glory in that kind of suffering. Oh, I'm suffering. My boss fired me. You stole something. And maybe there's something. I couldn't show up on time to work. And finally, my boss had enough and said, no, you're gone. You're gone. See you. Oh, I'm suffering. He says, that's not suffering. There's no glory in that. If you, if you, if you be buffeted for your faults and you, t- oh, I'll, I'll, I'll endure this suffering for the cause of Jesus. Not if you got, were a terrible employee and got fired. What a stain on Christianity, by the way. If you claim to be a Christian, you're a terrible employee. What does it look like on a practical level? It looks like somebody who submits patiently to hardships and inconveniences. That's another thing that's lost, even amongst the Christian community. We can't take any kind of inconvenience. We can't take any kind of of hardship. We can't, uh, you can't take any kind of uh, uh, backlash from your employer for anything or, or uh, uh, just enduring a hardship. Your, your boss asks you to do something you don't like. Well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to quit this job and go find another one. <sighs> I, I find it amazing. I, I remember a, a guy that he was on swing shifts. And he had to miss church half, half the time. He, and, and there was opportunities. And he'd come to me and go, pray, pastor, that I can, I can get this, uh, maybe this other opportunity. There's an opportunity coming up over here. And then he'd tell me, he'd say, well, I had a chance last week to take this other job that was 8 to 5 Monday through Friday, but I don't like doing that. You can't endure a little a bit of something that you don't enjoy doing so that you can be faithful to God's house? No, it says, what glory is there in that? Endure a little hardship. Endure a little... A little inconvenience. But as Christians even, and we would expect this from lost people, but Christians, to be able to in, endure patiently with things that weren't perfect. Our boss in Colorado, sometimes he would, he would, he were supposed to be paid on Thursday. And sometimes he would, uh, guys, I'm, 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 I'm in Denver, I'm stuck in traffic, I won't be able to get back. Boy, you wouldn't believe the uproar in the, in the, in the shop. Oh, we're not getting our checks tonight. I, I can't. Oh, it's not, we're supposed to tomorrow morning. I, I, oh. Like, dude, endure a little bit. And these people weren't Christians. So. But as a Christian, that ought, ought to be said of us that we can't just put up with a little inconvenience sometimes if, if our boss isn't perfect. It says we're supposed to be subject not only to the good and gentle bosses, but also to the froward ones. Even if your boss is a total... You fill in the blank, however you want to. Just mean, 
unfair. You might even, just a thick-headed punk, all right? Whatever. Can you not endure for the cause of Christ to be a light? Can you not put up with a little bit of inconvenience or somebody who does, well, he didn't treat me right, I'm just... I'm not talking about having, some, you know, they, they don't pay you for hours you work. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about just dealing with pe- pr- people's prickly personalities sometimes. You all got to deal with it. Amen. We all do. We exhibit the grace of God on our life when we endure hardships and imperfect bosses with patience. We show God's grace on our life. And it's a light to them. It's a light to them. It also looks like one who does not use the imperfections of their master as an excuse to do what's wrong. Well, he did this, and I'll just go do that. Well, he did this to me, or he said this to me. Well, then I'm just going to. That's not a Christian attitude. The sinful misconduct of, of one relation does not justify, I read this from Matthew Henry, the sinful retaliation of the other. The servant is bound to do his duty even though the master might be sinfully froward or perverse. Do your duty. Be a light. He goes on to say, this subjection they owe their masters who have a right to their service and that not only to the good and gentle such uh, such as use them well and treat them fairly but even to the crooked and perverse who are nearly impossible to please. No doubt we've seen evidences in the past of servants who couldn't do anything you ever had a boss that no matter what you did you couldn't do anything right you ever had a boss no matter what you did you you never got a compliment it was nothing but just condescension from your boss and 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 and, uh, you couldn't do anything right he'd find something you did wrong or or even make up stuff peter's saying better handle that with grace if you want to be a light for the lord because that's bigger you say well i i shouldn't have to put up with that Oh, well, we'll get to that in just a minute. We'll get to that in just a minute. It's because the second thing we're supposed to be called to not just submit, but to suffer patiently. Suffer patiently in verses 19 through 15. Why should we suffer patiently, Pastor? Why should I put up with somebody treating me like I know I don't deserve to be treated? Because for, let me just, apart from my notes, that's nothing but pride talking. Me, myself, I, I don't deserve well, we'll talk about what people deserve and what they don't deserve here in just a second. But first of all, the Bible says it's thankworthy. Why should I submit? Why should I suffer with patience? Because it's thankworthy, it says in verse 19. It's thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. In other words, nobody's impressed when you receive the just rewards of your wrongdoing, even when you do it patiently. Like, oh, I'm getting punished for my wrongdoing. I'll take it with patience. Nobody's impressed. But when you suffer wrongfully and you still maintain a patient and humble spirit, guess what? God stands up and takes notice. God stands up and takes notice, and so will a lost world. So will a lost world. Why should we do it? Because it's thankworthy. Why should we suffer patiently? Because, verse 21, because we know it's right. It's always right to do right. Amen? Verse number 21, for even hereunto were ye called. Called to what? Called to suffer. And listen, we, uh, we're, we're making analogies and crossover comparisons with this passage to us today. And really, they're talking about literal slaves. I don't think any of us are enslaved to our boss. Otherwise, you couldn't walk out the door and say, I quit. No, we ought to suffer patiently because we know it's right. Well, how are we going to know it's right? Well, the Holy Spirit will let us know. It says, if a man, verse 19, for conscience sake toward God, endure grief. He'll work on your conscience. He'll work in your heart. He'll prick your heart about it, Right? The Holy Spirit will let us know through our conscience. All of us have had that moment, haven't we, where we responded wrong to a boss or to another person that we're supposed to be serving and then later on regretted it and had to go back and say, man, I'm sorry. 
You've re- responded wrong. We know it's right because the Holy Spirit lets us know. And then also because, like I said before, God called us to it in verse number 21. By the terms of Christianity, listen, we're bound to deny ourselves and take up our cross. Deny ourselves, not go, well, I'm entitled to this. That's not what Jesus said. He said, take up your cross and follow me. And if a man compels you to go one mile, go two. And he's not talking about just somebody who says, hey, you want to go for a mile-long walk? He's talking about an abusive Roman soldier who would come along and say, here's my sword, here's my armor, my helmet, carry it. You have to go at least a mile with me, or you have to go up to a mile with me. And you say, hey, I'll carry it too for you, man. Suffer patiently because it's thankworthy. Suffer patiently because you know it's right. And then, most of all, suffer patiently because we have an example in Christ. Verses 21 through 24. It says, we were called because Christ, in verse 21, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that, we should follow, that you should follow his steps. Follow Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. Suffer You're going to suffer wrongfully if you're going to truly follow Christ. Well, what was Jesus' example? Well, he suffered wrongfully in verse number 22, who did no sin. It says he reviled not in verse number 23. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Boy, they they gave him a tongue lashing. They mocked him. The Roman soldiers put a, a purple robe on him and and smashed a crown of thorns into his skull, and then bowed mockingly before him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! Ha, ha, ha. Making fun. And Jesus, the Bible says, answered not a word. As a lamb led to the slaughter before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth, Isaiah 53. He reviled not. When he suffered, it says in verse 23, he threatened not. Boy, You ever had to keep your cool so you didn't kill somebody? (laughs) Amen? Most of us have been in some situation in our life where we said, okay, I got to take a deep breath and walk away from this or things are going to go south real quick. When we do that and we suffer patiently, even if we did nothing wrong, especially when we did nothing wrong, it says he threatened not. Nobody's ever had more of an ability to threaten and never has the gap been bigger before, between what he could do and what he did do than when Jesus hung on a cross for us. What he could have done, but what he did do. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have spoke a word, and they would have all fallen down dead. But he didn't even open his mouth to threaten against them. With every pounding of the nail into his hand and his wrist, he didn't say, if, when I get off this cross, I'm going to. If you, if you just knew what kind of power I had, to, he didn't even open his mouth. How guilty are we of opening our mouths when somebody mistreats us, treats us like second-class citizens, throwing our Christian cuss words out there when somebody cuts us off on the interstate. <laughs> oh. Right? The Bible says we have an example in Jesus and how we ought to conduct ourselves as servants. We're there to serve. We're here to serve on this earth. How would we respond in Jesus' spot? How would, what would you say to the Roman soldiers if you were hanging in excruciating pain on the cross? When people are hurting, they get short-tempered, don't they? How many of you know somebody who's really short-tempered when, they get, when they're in pain? <laughs> don't point at anybody in here, especially your wife or your husband, all right? No. All of us, when we're in pain, we, we, we tend to be frustrated. We tend to lash out. Jesus held his peace held his peace if we were hanging there boy we'd be muttering all kinds of things wouldn't we if we were still conscious after all the beating he took not jesus matthew henry summed it up for us he said the sufferings of christ should quiet us under the most unjust and cruel sufferings we meet with in the world he suffered voluntarily not for himself but for us with the utmost readiness, with perfect patience, from all quarters and all this, though he was God, man. He says, shall not we sinners who deserve the worst submit to the light afflictions of this life? 
which work for us an unspeakable advantage afterwards? And can we not put up with a little bit of suffering in this world that is microscopic compared to what Jesus went through for us? Why should we suffer patiently? Because, number four, because we aren't committed to a sinner. Your boss, you're not committed to your boss. You're not committed to some sinful man. You're committed to a just and righteous judge. Verse 23 says. It says Jesus committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And that's really what it boils down to. Can you endure as, a, as an employee of an unreasonable boss? Can you endure as a, a, a somebody who has to serve somebody that's condescending? Can you endure? Listen, even as, a, as your pastor who is imperfect, if I make a mistake, can you not... With grace, go. I'll keep serving, even though you made a mistake. I know you can, because some of you have done that. I've made mistakes with some of you in this room. And you've been gracious, and I appreciate it. Can we not be gracious with a church member who says something out of turn, and on accident, says something that came across wrong, but they didn't mean it that way, but because of our pride, we want to read into it and get all hot under the collar? Boy, we shouldn't act that way. That's not what Jesus did. We're not committed to sinners. We're committing ourselves to a righteous judge. Him that judgeth righteously. God doesn't lose track of the score. He sees every injustice and every moment that you suffer wrongfully. So let me ask you tonight, how is your commitment to the righteous judge? If you truly have the attitude, I'm committed to a righteous judge. So how this boss treats me, whatever. Or how this other employee talks to me even though he's not my boss? Whatever. I can endure patiently. I can keep my mouth shut. I don't have to revile if I'm reviled. I don't have to lash out if I'm inflicted with pain. How's your commitment to the righteous judge tonight? What kind of, what kind of things did Jesus endure? Verse 24, who... His own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. It's like, whoa, 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 keep the big picture in mind here. This is the righteous judge you've committed yourself to. You can put up with a little harshness from a boss. You can put up with a little condescension from your fellow employees, who, by the way, you're called to serve them too. You can put up with another church member who maybe doesn't even treat you the right way. And maybe they don't act like a Christian like a Christian should. But that doesn't give you the excuse not to. Have you committed yourself to the righteous judge or are you committing yourself to me, myself, and I? That's really what it boils down to. Humble yourself one to another. Humble yourself to your boss. Humble yourself to your fellow employees. And humble yourself to the fellow Christians in your church and the people you interact with every day and extend grace to them. Because we ought to be the kind of servant that Jesus was for us. Amen? Let's all stand tonight. Somebody once said the true test of whether you're a servant or not is how you respond when somebody treats you like one. Oh, pastor, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. How did you respond the last time somebody treated you like a servant? just as guilty right here i'm not up here being a pious gas bag hopefully tonight (laughs) just as guilty and all of our flesh wants to get in the way when somebody treats us in a way we don't feel like we deserve to be treated but god says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall god resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble amen don't forget about operation outreach this saturday at 10 a.m. Looking forward to getting some uh, flyers out about our missions conference. And uh, that comes up on Sunday through Wednesday. Don't forget to sign up to give out some gift cards if you haven't already. And then don't forget we're going to be taking up a special offering uh, for this uh, uh, pastor and his family down in Florida. Okay, And uh, uh, so if I change the way we do that, I'll let you know. There's ways we can do it that it's not a tax liability on them, but it would have to involve everybody just kind of putting it in a pot and sending it down to them, but not going through the offerings of the church. Um, Or if we could maybe send it to the church down in 
uh, down in uh, Florida, Tampa, the, the Westgate Baptist, maybe, and then have them pass it on. I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll have to figure something out. But uh, we'll think about that. I'll let you know before Sunday, either th- both through text message and the prayer line call on Friday, probably. Uh, looking forward to that because there's a lot of people that aren't here tonight that hopefully will take part in it, okay? And then Chili Cook-Off is uh, the 30th at 5 p.m. Uh, it'll be a fun time, always is, uh, right here in our fellowship hall. And I'll have Chili Cook-Off in our evening service right out there, all right? Thanks for being faithful tonight and uh, for being the kind of church you ought to be. You're a blessing, amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, we come before you and we're so grateful uh, for all you've given us. We, we think of that pastor down in Florida, uh, his family and him living in a tent right now um, in the heat of humidity of Florida. Um, and um, I can't imagine the struggle there. And uh, so uh, I pray that uh, we'd be grateful for all you've blessed us with. We can sure be thankful. And uh, Lord, help us to be able to be a blessing to them on Sunday. We love you. Thank you for all you've done for us tonight. And I pray you just give us a good uh, rest of our evening and keep us safe going home. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Thanks for coming tonight. Make sure our guests feel welcome tonight.